So uh, as we uh, begin now in uh, chapter eight, this is really a turning point. We've, we've really uh, come through uh, the first half of the gospel of Mark. And uh, this first half has been focused on kind of that question of Jesus's identity. Who is this? And we have seen that asked in various ways. And we've seen Jesus's identity revealed um, through his miracles, through his authority that he has uh, demonstrated, um, through uh, calling disciples to be around him, um, through parables, and in a variety of ways. Uh, we have seen that um, that Jesus has come to proclaim that the kingdom has arrived and that um, that because of the kingdom's arrival, um, uh, now people are being called to respond and to repent and to uh, return uh, into and to turn to God and to turn to his kingdom that is made evident in Jesus Christ. And so um, as Jesus um, has been going through uh, calling the disciples uh we finally get to this point uh, where the disciples at the uh, middle part of chapter eight um, finally kind of called Jesus. Uh, Jesus brings it to a head. Who do you think I am? And of course, they say that he is the Christ. And that answer comes from Peter, uh, that he is the Messiah. And then immediately, the last thing we saw is there's this huge revelation. Jesus is the Messiah. And then... Jesus says, don't tell anyone about him. And uh, that's where this, uh, this left last time. So uh, with that, um, let's look then at verse um, 31. And uh, let's look at uh, verses 31, uh, just a short section there, 31 through uh, 33. If you, someone could read that section for us. Oh. I might make it through that much. All right, thanks. <clears throat> and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and he reject and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So, uh, thank you, Martha. Appreciate it. Uh, so, we get into this uh, section here. And we're going to find that in this part of the, the gospel, particularly chapters 8, 9, and 10, more than anywhere in the gospel of Mark, Jesus is directing his a, a teaching, kind of its direct teaching to his disciples. Previously, he's been teaching largely in parables and in his miracles, and now it is just straightforward kind of uh, didactic teaching um, that he is giving to uh, the disciples. And we have what is the first of three uh, passion predictions that are here in this middle section of the gospel. And we're going to see this cycle that occurs three different times where Jesus will predict uh, what's going to happen. And then there's the ensuing dialogue and conversation that follows that. So the uh, first of these predictions, Jesus, in each of these predictions, there's similar uh, things that happen. Jesus is going to be with his disciples. They're going to be on the way, on their way to Jerusalem. And then he will predict that he will die, but he also predicts resurrection. So those are the common elements that are in all three of these uh, passion predictions. And for the first time in the gospel of Mark, Jesus now speaks clearly of who he is. Who does he call himself in verse 31? What does he call himself? Son of man. Son of man. So this is a phrase. We've actually <laughs> seen this phrase once before. Uh, well, two times, actually, but it was in the same uh, section of the gospel. But it was back at the very beginning. It was in chapters uh, two um, and three where Jesus declared his authority to forgive sins. That was in that story where Jesus heals the, the man whose friends had brought him through the roof and he, he was paralyzed and uh, he was healed. And then there is the story where in chapter two, also verse 28, uh, where Jesus refers to the Son of Man's authority over the Sabbath. And so in both of those sections, um, it's been since that time. 
this name, this title, Son of Man, has kind of been lingering out there. And now we're kind of going to get a fuller understanding of what uh, the Son of Man um, actually means and uh, and what what it looks like. So he describes then the destiny of the Son of Man. What words does he use to describe the what the Son of Man's destiny? What does the Son of Man have to do? Suffer. So you have well, suffering. See, reject. Rejection. Kill. Killing. <laughs> And rise again. And rising. So that's, you have the suffering, the rejection, and we get a little bit of, you know, insight into to how they're going to suffer, how he's going to suffer, uh, that he will die, he'll be killed, and then rise again. So undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed, and then after three days, uh, rise again. And then Mark, uh, Mark uses an interesting verb there in verse 31. Um, and a lot of translations will say must, uh, that uh, must, uh, and um, this is a word of it is necessary. Uh, Jesus began to teach them that it is necessary that the Son of Man would go through these things. The necessity of Jesus uh, going through this, it indicates that all of this is not some inevitable tragedy. This is all part of God's design. It's all part of God's plan for Jesus. It's all part of what the Son of Man came to do. That this is this is part of that. So that word is a small word, but it's a very significant word, and it's going to occur in all three of these uh, passion predictions um, of must. Then at the beginning of verse thirty-two, Mark says something cu very curious as well. Um, what does he say that Jesus Jesus said this how did he say this openly. plainly or openly i think openly really catches the nuance in it in a way um that what did he say at the end of verse 30 when his disciples when peter announced you are the christ tell no one about him yeah so he sternly ordered them don't don't talk about this and now here's jesus though talking about it what do you think's the difference? Why does Jesus not want the disciples talking about it, but here he is like talking about it quite plainly? Because he his own people. Uh, his own people? I'm sorry. Uh, could you say that again, bud? He was talking to his own people. <clears throat> so he's talking to his inner circle, kind of that idea that, that he's not spreading it out there. I think that's part of it here. It's who he's directing it to. And maybe he wanted to spread the word instead of them. Okay, Keith, maybe. that's a valid point. He might have wanted to spread the word instead of them. Why do you think Jesus might be the one who wants to make that uh, spread the word? Because it basically, he he wanted to spread, see, sow the seed, basically, and then to them, and then basically, uh, and then that then so so it to other people then. Ultimately, that is the plan, that the disciples will be the ones to go out. But here, here get, comes to the key thing, and that's what we're going to see in all of these interactions. The reason that Jesus doesn't want the disciples to spread the news that he's the Christ is that they don't really get what being the Christ means. Jesus has to explain what being the Christ means. And these explanations that he's given of what the Son of Man must go through are showing us that the Messiah is not what the disciples and most Jewish people were expecting. The disciples and most Jewish people were not expecting a suffering Messiah. They were expecting a conquering Messiah. And so when the, when the disciples get the idea that Jesus is the Christ, their immediate idea is he's the Christ and he's going to go destroy the Romans and set us free uh, with some military or political victory. But Jesus wants to redefine what being the Messiah means. And he redefines what being the Messiah means by saying that being the Messiah means suffering and rejection and death. Ultimately, though, resurrection which is the ultimate vindication uh, and demonstration of the power of the Messiah. And so the, the, the Messiah does have power. The Messiah is glorious, but that glory comes in a way that no one expected. 
And so the reason that Jesus speaks plainly about who he is, whereas he tells the disciples not to tell anyone, is that Jesus uh, is kind of uh, defining what the Messiah means, and he's redefining it in a way that the disciples and other Jewish uh, people would not have understood at that time. And to get to the point that the disciples didn't understand it, what is the immediate reaction when Jesus says uh, what, the, uh, what the Son of Man must undergo? Peter said, no way. Yeah, there's Peter, right? It's always Peter. He was the one who spoke up uh, and said he's the Christ. And here's Peter. Takes him. It, it's great. He takes him to the side and he begins to rebuke him. Uh, so, hey, Jesus, come over here. No, you know, this isn't right. This is not what the Messiah is about. Like, you got to rethink this, Jesus. Um, Jesus has just told him this is the thing that must happen, and uh, Pete's like, no, nope, not that. No, I don't think so. He it says he actually <laughs> took hold of Jesus, so he kind of grabbed Jesus and said, "Hey, Jesus, uh, we got to talk." And he he began to rebuke him, and in that way in which he kind of um, he says, you know, this death stuff, this suffering stuff, this wasn't part of the deal. This isn't what we signed up for when we said we we're going to follow you, and when we when we decided that you're the Christ. This isn't <laughs> isn't what what we had in mind. And so he, um, Peter, in a sense, by the way in which he grabs hold of Jesus and he rebukes him, kind of reverses um, the master disciple relationship. He puts himself in the place of the master and puts Jesus as the one who's hearing from him, and he wants. Uh, to warn Jesus and attempt to impose upon Jesus a messianic expectation that does not include suffering, that does not include rejection, that doesn't include death. And um, so uh, he clearly, uh, Peter is not happy with what Jesus has said. And Jesus then, and you get the sense here, we always say, oh, yeah, no, Peter, he's crazy. He always opens his mouth and speaks up. But you get the sense that Peter was speaking for all the disciples, because look at what Jesus does. He turns and looks at his disciples. He doesn't just say this to Peter. It's almost like Peter speaking for the rest of them. And now he addresses all of them and says, hey, uh, he turns the tables and sets it back to the way it's supposed to be, master, disciple. And he rebukes Peter and says to Peter, get get behind me. But not only does he say get behind me, but he, he, he calls Peter, uh, gives Peter a new title. <laughs> Satan. Uh, yeah, Satan. It, it's, it, it's Satan. Uh, he, he basically says, you are in league with Satan. Now, when did we last see, we've seen Satan a couple of times in the gospel of Mark. Uh, what are some of the times that he's appeared so far? When he's tempted. The temptation is a big one, right? And if we think about the nature of the temptation, what was what was Satan trying to do to Jesus in the in that temptation in the wilderness? Tempting he was trying to tempt him to uh, throw himself down. Yeah, that's part of that uh, was one of those temptations. That's in uh Matthew and Luke's version of it. In short, it's to, to deny God. That's right. That's right. To deny God and to deny, uh, basically, to take a shortcut to glory. Right. To go to the be <clears throat> this great person without following the path that God has laid out for him. And so, what Peter shows here by by Jesus kind of calling Peter Satan, he's saying you're in league with. Satan, this one who tried to take me off of the path, this one who tried to uh, take uh, me off of uh, the plan that God had for me and out of the plan that God had for me. And here you're just a stumbling block, just like Satan was. And we see also that in other places um, that, um, you know, we see that Jesus is goes in, Satan is, is seen as this strong man, and Jesus is the one who comes in and uh, frees the people from that that ty uh, tyranny of Satan. And so um, Satan is the opposition. And so what he's saying is, Peter, if that's your understanding of what the Messiah is, and if your understanding of the Messiah doesn't have any room for suffering and rejection and death, then uh, you are an obstacle to me, just like Satan is. 
you are keeping me from the plans and the purposes that the father has. And so uh, he, he uh, really is, is recognizing um, Satan is in league and in with, uh, I'm sorry, Peter is in league with Satan. And he says, you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. In other words, um, you're blocking my path uh, because you have this human understanding uh, of what of what it means to be uh, the Messiah. Uh, you're holding me back. Uh, the other thing is when he says "get behind me" is pretty significant. Is "get behind me"? That's basically okay. Let's get this straight, Peter. You're not the one in charge. I'm the master. You're the one who follows. So uh, he's putting uh, Peter back in his place in a sense there. Um, uh, do you have any uh, questions or observations on those uh, short verses? But there's a lot in those, uh, those uh, three verses there. Uh, any uh, questions or observations, things that you would like to uh, bring up? All right. Let's... Uh, look at the next section and this will go from 834 uh to the first verse of verse 9 so 834 to 91 would someone mind reading that i will thank you Polly. then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said if anyone would come after me he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone ashamed of me and, and my words in, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Thank you. Appreciate that. So um, here we have some formal instruction and note that um, Jesus is talking to the disciples, but he also includes the crowd and he addresses basically anyone. And that would include us as readers as well. This is this is his call to anyone who wants to be his follower. Anyone who wants to be um, his disciple is addressed. Um, and uh, interesting thing in the verbs here is um, we saw in that last verse, verse 33, that Jesus told Peter to get behind me. That's the same term that he uses here to describe a follower in verse 34, that whoever wishes to follow behind me. Uh, so it's kind of like uh, Peter was called to be a follower when Jesus told him to get behind him. And now he says, if anyone wants to become my followers, if anyone wants to follow behind me, um, he then gives us kind of the criteria that disciples are, what are disciples called to do if they want to be a follower of, of Jesus? Deny himself. Deny Denial. Denial. So self-denial. Take up his cross. Taking up a cross and, follow him. and following. So you have that follow is reiterated um, there. So three things that are basically uh, basically the criteria for following Jesus. Self-denial, denying themselves, taking up the cross, and following Jesus. So um, when you look at these three things, denial, uh, I think, you know, self-denial in some sense here is denying kind of when Jesus had just told the disciples, you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And so it's denying in a sense that human reasoning and the human reasoning that we have that God's kingdom can be brought in by kind of earthly political means or by military triumph. 
And that our, our self-denial also goes to the idea that we are all about, and the disciples are no different than the rest of us, human nature, we're all about glory and honor. And uh, starting from that, it, it, denying that is all about turning from our desires for glory and honor and following Jesus on this path to the cross, because ultimately, Mark would say that's the only way to glory in the end. If we really want glory, paradoxically, we have to give up kind of that human idea of honor and glory and 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 uh, renounce ourselves in order to follow Jesus. Um, and so you have the self-denial, you have take up their cross. You know, sometimes people will talk about, uh, you know, taking up your cross is a difficult situation in life I have to bear or something like that. But in the culture here, taking up your cross was not just about a difficult situation. Taking up your cross was about actually literally being executed by the Romans. Uh, so, you know, in, in our day, it might be, you might say, oh, it was taking up the electric chair or something like that. This is what it was about was the fact that you were actually risking your life in order to follow this one who was proclaiming a kingdom that was different than the kingdoms of this world. That there is a risk that comes with that, uh, including the risk of death, and uh, and following Jesus. So, so following Jesus. So, what this is saying is, is that Jesus says the path of the Messiah to glory goes through suffering and death. And guess what? The path for his disciples goes through the same. It goes through suffering and death. But ultimately, where does it lead? For Jesus, it's suffering and death, resurrection, and for his followers, suffering and death, and it ultimately leads to resurrection and vindication. So the path that Jesus uh, charts is the path that his disciples are called to follow. And Mark um, emphasizes is going to emphasize this again and again, especially in this section of these passion predictions, is that discipleship is defined by messiahship. What it means to be the Messiah shows us what it means to be a disciple because a disciple is a person who follows Jesus. He explains a little bit about what this self-denial and, and taking up our cross and following him looks uh, like and the reason for it in verse 35 uh, and four. So that points to the purpose. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake, for Jesus' sake, and for the sake of the gospel, the good news, will save it. <clears throat> so there's this paradoxical nature here, is that Jesus' call to discipleship is paradoxically both a call to death and a summons to life, but that we live by dying. That's, that's the, the weird nature of, of, the, of the call of Christ is that by dying to self, by self-denial, by, by uh, dying on a cross, by following his path, that is the ultimate way to find life. And so uh, this, this is the call uh, that we have, uh, that you, know, you can have all the glory of this world, but you can lose your life, and there's no substitute for that. So what he's saying is none of that matters. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life. What can we give in return for his life? So all of this is pointing to that fact that uh, we can re reject the way of the Messiah and lose our life, or we can follow this way, a way that is uh, a way of suffering and rejection, but ultimately it will lead to what true life is. And so uh, very kind of paradoxical statement there, but it's really understanding that. And then he says um, that those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. So he doesn't have a lot to say about the people in, of that time uh, or the readers of Mark's gospel. Probably he wouldn't have a lot to say about the adulterous and sinful generation now either. I think this is the adult, uh, adulterous and sinful generation, that generation whose mind is set not on divine things, but on human things. That generation that is not about uh, the kingdom of God, but it is about um, self, uh, and, and it is about uh, the nature, the kingdom of Satan, and and the glory that is found not through uh, renouncing oneself, but by uh, by uh, the way in which the world defines glory by uh, asserting ourselves in ways that 
uh, defeat others and instead of uh, suffering, bring um, uh, inflict suffering upon others. So that's the way the world kind of works. And that's this adulterous and sinful generation. And he says, if we're ashamed of, of what Jesus is teaching, if we're ashamed of the nature of his kingdom, if we're ashamed of the nature of the, uh, of the Messiah that he is, then uh, he will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels. So <clears throat> he's pointing to the fact that there is glory in this, that the Son of Man's path all leads to ultimate glory. This is not just a path of suffering. It's the path of suffering that leads to ultimate glory. And when the Son of Man returns, um, what side you're on in this um, matter and how you understand the nature of the kingdom and how you have, whether you have followed Christ or not, is what matters. And then we get to this really interesting verse in, in verse one of chapter nine. And he said to them, truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they, they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Um, there are many different uh, ways that uh, scholars have uh, kind of unpacked this. Uh, some see this as referring to uh, Christ's second coming. And there are scholars who say, uh, you know, Mark thought that Jesus was going to return in his generation, and he was just wrong. Uh, I don't really buy it that way. But that's how some people take it, and uh, that's one interpretation. But there are, are two other interpretations that I think are, are a little better. Um, and that is, um, Jesus has told his disciples, he already said this, that he would die, but after three days, he would rise again. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that when he's talking about the glory, the kingdom of God coming in power, I think what he is talking about is actually the resurrection. That, that he will, uh, that Agreed. some in that generation, some of those that are standing there will see that vindication that comes through the resurrection. They will experience that apparent failure of the crucifixion, and but they will see God's power in the resurrection, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ will be the coming of God, uh, the kingdom of God coming in power. Uh, it's that transformation of suffering into ultimate glory, into power. So that's one way of seeing it. The other way that some scholars see it is that some scholars suggest that it points not to the resurrection, but to the event that we will see next, which is the transfiguration, which is also a revelation of Christ's glory. So uh, those are two possibilities for how people have seen um, that verse. Uh, I really tend to think it's it's leaning towards the resurrection. I do think that the transfiguration points to the resurrection as well. So I think both of those are uh, are possible ways to interpret that observations or questions or other ways that you would like to talk about that or anything else in that section. This is some of the hardest teaching of Jesus, I think, because, uh, you know, what does it practically mean sometimes in our lives to, you know, deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him? I think, um, it's it's the challenging part of that uh, that really hits us. Yeah, I think it means don't live a sinful world. Mm -hmm. And like it says, don't honor your father and mother. But it sometimes it's hard. <laughs> and yeah, it's hard to live the way of Jesus for sure. And uh, but we're gonna find out that I think. The one thing that does come is that, and Jesus is going to talk about this, that there is empowerment that comes for living this life uh, because of the resurrection and because of the giving of the Holy Spirit. So he's going to talk about that, too, as we as we go. Mm -hmm. Well, I think where he was talking about those not tasting death who will see the kingdom of God, I, I definitely think that was referring to the crucifixion because... At that point, he was talking to the crowd as well as his disciples. Yep. And the people, the people who saw the transfiguration were just three people. Yeah, yeah, that's a valid point that it was the crowd 
and disciples there. And, and there were more than just the, uh, just the three that actually witnessed the transfiguration. And evidently, you know, if we follow this story and we'll talk about that as we go, the transfiguration, they don't even tell anyone about that until after the resurrection. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, I one. tend to think it's the crucifixion resurrection, that that's the coming of uh, the kingdom. Yeah, that's how I find it, the coming of the kingdom. But I've been finding some other movies out there like that. I guess, I don't know if you ever heard of this, Matthew Tubi, T-U-B-I. It has movies, TV shows, and more. No, I haven't. It's good too. That's cool. Yeah, you can search up custom movies. You can search up anything. Jack? There is another interpretation. Uh, we all know of martyrs who, who have themselves been transfigured. Uh, they are about to be killed or they're being burned alive or whatever. And it doesn't matter to them because they have seen the power and the glory of God. Yeah, that's a way you could see it as well, and would be appropriate uh, for uh, Mark's uh, kind of audience, where it does seem like there's some suffering going on and, and persecution that's happening. So um, that's another way to uh, see it, is that the kingdom coming in power is those who faithfully follow Jesus and actually literally uh, are able to give their lives uh, for the kingdom. Uh, and following the same path that he did. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. Follow the path. Yep. That's what we to do. do. Yeah. I remember another movie that remembers that right in Follow the Path, Miracles Can Heaven. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's kind of see then. Uh, it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition. We have this idea of suffering and rejection, and then we get this vision now that comes uh, with the transfiguration uh, and the teaching that follows it. So if um, someone could read verses 2 through 13 here of chapter 9. How many? Six days later. Six days later. Jesus You're getting an echo there. I'm not sure. Okay. Oh, back. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. we are still getting sure. Yeah. Sounds like feedback on a mic. No. <laughs> As he was transfigured, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, but they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly they looked around, and they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked him, why do the scribes say Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the son of man that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written about them. Thank you, Jan. So uh, this uh, begins six days later. Um, so uh, six days after Jesus had given that uh, initial uh, discussion to his disciples, uh, we have um, 
six days and he takes three uh, kind of the inner circle of the 12, Peter, James, and John, and they go on a high mountain uh, where they could be by themselves. Um, that six days, you know, it could just be that was the temporal thing. It was after six days. But there is also the idea that six days um, could indicate that if it was after six day, it would be on the seventh day that this was happening. Um, so um, the seventh day, of course, has the sense of fulfillment. Six days also recalls Exodus chapter 24, uh, where Moses uh, spent six days on the mountain with Joshua and then the Lord uh, called to him from the cloud. So there's some resonance there. Mountains, of course, themselves are significant places where uh, the divine revelation often occurs and people are um, uh, in communication with God. Uh, you see that frequently in the Old Testament. But it's funny, we get up, they go up to the high mountain and without any kind of warning or any kind of flourish, uh, Mark just simply says, and Jesus was transfigured before them. I was like, okay, well, what's that mean? And so then he, he begins to give us a little bit into the, at, that his clothes became dazzling white so that no one on earth could bleach them. So uh, he, his appearance just totally changes. And this story uh, focuses on the significance of Jesus's relationship to God and also kind of the way that his disciples continue to not really uh, get it. Um, now, as readers, we're aware of his relationship to God. We were told back in the very beginning of this book, Mark introduces him as Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. We know who he is. We have seen um, how uh, Jesus is, is living into to what he is called to be, but none of the characters in the story have been given this information. It, it, but here, it is revealed to Peter and James and John on the mountain. And um, all of this language is, is using language that is associated with glory, that's associated with the appearance of heavenly beings, with the word theophany, which is an appearance of God. This is all the stuff that goes along with that, with the brightness and the intensity of it. Um, it's something that could not be generated by human hands. But what seems to be even more surprising is the introduction of two guys who appear talking with Jesus. And who are those two people? Elijah and Moses. So Elijah and Moses. And what is significant about this, there's a lot that's significant about this. But uh, one of the things is that it's not Moses and Elijah. It's interesting that Elijah is mentioned first. Because if you think about it, uh, within the scriptures, who comes first? It's Moses. And then later on, Elijah. And um, some people will say that um, these two figures are uh, referring to the law and the prophets. Well, that's possible. But again, if it was the law and the prophets, you would expect Moses to be first because he's the law guy and uh, Elijah is the prophet guy. Also, if it is the law and the prophets, do you even need Elijah? Because Moses actually could check both of those boxes. He was called the prophet, and they said another prophet would come like Moses. And uh, he also was uh, the one who was there to mediate the law. And so, um, so what is uh, going on here? Um, there's probably a couple things that are involved in this. Um, one is that, as we talked about, Moses and Elijah are both figures who had experienced God's presence on a mountain. Um, Mount Sinai, we're familiar with Moses and the receiving of the law. But also um, after um, Elijah has that uh, great battle with uh, the prophets of Baal, he then encounters God on a mountain in, in 1 Kings 19. So they both encounter and experience God's presence on a mountain. And here's the second thing that isn't always uh, as clear, but comes from the Jewish tradition. And that is both of these men were celebrated in the Jewish tradition for having been transported into heaven. That uh, is very clear. Elijah, we see that kind of story where he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily die. He just goes right into heaven and leaves Elisha uh, behind and, uh, and 
we see that in Second Kings chapter three, and then Jewish reflects the Jewish tradition reflects on that quite a bit. Now Moses, we do have Moses' death recorded, but in Deuteronomy 34, it's pretty clear that his place of burial is unknown. We don't know where he was buried. And the Jewish tradition um, says that Moses was exalted to heavenly glory, and that's why we don't know where his body is and we can't locate his body. And so both of these men were seen as being uh, taken um, and being transported into heaven. So with that connection, then, we could link this, this conversation with Jesus, Elijah, and Moses to Jesus's words in chapter 838, when he says that the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Um, Jesus will be transported to heaven and take his place as the Son of Man in the glory of his Father and the holy angels, just like these two Old Testament uh, figures were. And so this scene as a whole, what's happening in this transfiguration is it is a scene that anticipates the glorification of Jesus. But what Jesus has made clear to us in the previous chapter, in the end of chapter 8, is that that glorification must take place by means of his suffering, death, and resurrection, and that will ultimately lead to his glory. So, and why would Elijah be named first? Well, it's possible that it's just because, did you notice how Elijah is in the big, has been a figure that's occurred throughout? Remember when they said, hey, uh, Jesus said, hey, disciples, who do people say that I am? Well, some say Elijah. Well, there, there was Elijah. Elijah is kind of in the background here a lot. And then at the end of this story, um, at the end of the transfiguration scene, as they're coming off the mountain, Elijah again becomes the topic of conversation. And so it's probably because Elijah is really important in the surrounding narrative that he's reported as first. But the disciples see this, and uh, what's their reaction? They were frightened. So we have they were frightened. You think about frightened. We've seen the disciples frightened before. Is that seen as a positive thing? Remember, they were frightened on the boat when uh, Jesus calms yeah. the, the wind of the waves. They, uh, they were frightened. I think both of the boat scenes, if I'm not mistaken, there was the one in chapter six as well when Jesus walks on the water. Uh, so when they, he stills the storm and when he walks in the water. And both of those were contrasted with fear and faith. So fear is the opposite of faith. So there's one thing is fear is seen <coughs> as not having faith. It's a lack of faith that they have here. How else would you describe what they do here? They wanted to make three tabernacles. So uh, Peter wants to make three tabernacles. And, and he wants to make one for Moses and Elijah and Jesus. So, uh, in other words, Peter kind of wants to memorialize the moment, right? He wants to like, oh, let's just capture this moment and, and, and keep it like this. Well, what's the problem with that? If he commemorates this with a permanent shrine and Jesus has this booth that he stays at, Jesus isn't then able to fulfill his mission and his destiny and his God-given purpose. And so uh, Peter uh, is once again standing in the way of Jesus competing, uh, completing uh, what God has uh, called him to do. And so uh, that's kind of a, uh, a way in which uh, Peter really doesn't get it. He wants the glory now. He wants to hold on to that glory instead of allowing Jesus to find the true path to that glory which Jesus has already said is through suffering. And then there's a, a third thing that it says to us about Peter. So Peter says, says he wants to make the dwellings. We're told that they were terrified. That would be the disciples. The three disciples were terrified. And between that, there's one other thing that it tells us about, about Peter. He didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to say. In other words, um uh he didn't get it he he's a little bit ignorant he 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 was uh not 
He didn't know how to handle this. And that, again, is a quality that has been associated with the disciples throughout this narrative, that they just don't get it. And they just don't get Jesus and they don't know the right response. And so uh, we saw that when Jesus told them earlier um, about the loaves and the fishes. And Jesus said, why do you still not perceive? Why are your, Why do you still fail to see it? Um, they didn't get Jesus. And again, once again, um, he doesn't get it. So the disciples, so Jesus appears. It's a sign of his glory. The disciples don't get it. They demonstrate basically a lack of faith. And uh, once again, kind of uh, an obstacle to Jesus fulfilling his mission. And then all of a sudden we have the cloud and the cloud comes and overshadows them. And then we have uh, the voice. So clouds, of course, do remind us of scenes like the Old Testament in Sinai as the cloud was with the people of Israel and was a sign of God's presence. And this voice that tells us what we already know, but the disciples haven't heard this yet. And what does it say? This is my beloved son. Hear him. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Well, where have we heard this is my beloved son? In the Bible. Baptism. At the baptism, right? In chapter one in the baptism, Jesus hears that. And we as readers have heard it. We know that this is true. But now here the voice of God uh, reiterates it to the disciples. So just as the first part of Mark's story started out with the voice of God identifying Jesus as the beloved son. So now the second part, uh, second half of Mark's gospel uh, starts with this voice confirming it to this inner circle of disciples and confirming his identity as the beloved son. So they're told that he's beloved son. And then the second part of that phrase uh, was uh, the, the voice of God instructs them to do what? Hear him, listen to him. Listen to him. So it's a call to obedience. It's called to listen to the words of the beloved son. In light of the context, what words might that, that voice of God be calling the disciples to heed? What has Jesus been teaching about? The word of God. He has. And he specifically has. his call to, to be a disciple and the call of discipleship, right? His call that he has to go through suffering and be rejected and the call for disciples to follow likewise. So this is a call from God to the, the voice of God is calling these disciples to take Jesus seriously and listen to what he has been saying about the true nature of the kingdom of God. And uh, so listen, uh, listen to him, listen to the call to share his destiny of suffering and death. <laughs> and then the disciples, they, it says they looked around. What's, you can have some interpretation as to what exactly that means, but I think they were looking around kind of confused, like, where's this voice coming from? What's it doing? Again, they still kind of are confused. And the only person that they now see is Jesus, and uh, no one else is there with him anymore, but only Jesus. And we wonder now, are they going to listen to him or not? And that's kind of the question as we go. So uh, they're coming down the mountain, and Jesus, first of all, tells them, don't tell anyone about this. Uh, don't tell anyone until uh, the Son of Man's risen from the dead. So uh, don't mention this until the resurrection. And wow, for once the disciples obey, it says they kept the matter to themselves. Awesome. So, so good points for them. These three guys got it, but they began to question, it says, about what this uh, resurrection uh, meant. And what does this mean, this resurrection uh, that Jesus is talking about? And so um, then they, they ask a question. And the question is uh, about Elijah. So again, Elijah is, is the subject as he was previously in chapter eight. And they ask about what's this relationship between the son of man and Elijah? Uh, that's what they say that Elijah must come first because they knew in Malachi, which is the last of the Old Testament prophets, um, it seems to indicate that Elijah would uh, return in order to introduce the the messianic era and so how does jesus answer uh their question about whether elijah has to come first 
to restore all things. Yeah, so Elijah does have to come first to destroy all, all to restore all things, to put things in order. Um, you could say maybe to prepare things. Uh, that's kind of the idea. That's why Elijah does have to come first. Then he, he asked a weird question at the end of verse 12 that doesn't at first seem to really have to do with Elijah. But what is the question? Why is it written that the Son of Man goes through many sufferings and be tempted? Yeah, he's back to this whole thing about the Son of Man going through suffering. So he says, Elijah did come first. Why is it written that the Son of Man has to go through suffering? Well, where is it written in the Old Testament? There's places like Isaiah 52 that talks about Jesus as the suffering servant. And even in the Daniel, where we have the Son of Man imagery that talks about how uh, the Son of Man suffers. Uh, but um, why is that written? And then he, he says this. So he says, Elijah does have to come. He asked, why is it written that the Son of Man has to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? In other words, be rejected. And then he says, but I tell you, Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written about him. So what's he talking about? I, what Jesus said when to the crucifixion. Elijah rejected as I will be rejected. Elijah was rejected, and so the Son of Man will be rejected, yes. There is this correlation that the Son of Man's rejection parallels the prophet's rejection. So just as Elijah was rejected, but when he says that Elijah has come, might he be referring to someone else? John? Maybe John? Yeah, and you think about John the Baptist, right? Because what's John's role? John's role is to prepare the way, to kind of order the way, to restore, in a sense, to set and, and get things in order. And that's what John came to do, as, as you see uh, in chapter one, um, where he is the messenger who was sent ahead to prepare the way. Um, and he then appeared in the wilderness and, and, and proclaimed the forgiveness of sins and talked about the one who was to come after him. The indication is, is that John the Baptist is seen as Elijah, who is preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. And when it says that they did to him whatever they pleased, well, what did they do? They killed him. <laughs> so when it says that Elijah came and, and, and they did to him whatever they pleased, he's talking about the... Uh, the basically the death of john the baptist here and that john the baptist um he came he put everything in order he set the way for jesus he accomplished his mission the mission that god had for him uh but they did to him whatever they pleased um and he is the forerunner of the messiah even in the fact that he has to go through suffering uh just like the messiah does elijah the new elijah john the baptist suffers in the same way that the Son of Man will suffer, but that suffering will ultimately lead to glory. The suffering of Elijah, the suffering of John the Baptist, leads to the glory of the coming of the Son of Man, and the suffering of the Messiah, the suffering of Jesus, will ultimately lead to his vindication and resurrection. So, uh, kind of an interesting way of talking about the coming of Elijah uh, as they're coming down the mountain um, becomes that discussion because. He appeared up there on the mountain with Jesus. So um, I think that uh, is an interesting parallel there. So all of this is pointing, though, to the fact of the nature of Jesus's um, messiahship, that just as John had to go through that, so Jesus will have to go through that. Don't be surprised when the Messiah suffers. Observations, questions. Many people thought John was Elijah. Yeah, uh, they did. And even the, some of them thought Jesus was John the Baptist, come back to life. So you have both of those things too. <laughs> there you go. But yes, uh, Elijah was really associated. And um, some of the, it seems like some of the gospel writers make that um, 
that kind of connection between Elijah as the forerunner and, and John even clearer. But yeah, this was seen as this idea that John the Baptist is the prophet who prepares the way for Jesus. All right. So uh, any final uh, questions tonight? I think that's a good stopping point because the next section there is uh, 14 through 29. It's pretty long. So we'll unpack that next time. And don't lose sight of the fact as we go through that, that um, this is uh, happening that same day. It's, it's right after they come off the mountain that this event then in turning at verse 14 takes place. And so we'll pick it up at 914 uh, yes. when we come together uh next week any uh questions or things you would like to uh bring out or asked about in that uh section that we looked at this evening or anything else we've seen so far as we've followed in the gospel of mark all right Thank <laughs> you.